Merry Christmas. It's good to see everyone here. What do you say at Christmas? Like I know at Easter you say he is risen and then you say he's risen indeed. I don't know, he's born, he's born indeed. I don't know. <laughs> but we know that our Saviour has come uh, and he was born uh, as a man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Um, and he lived that wonderful life uh, of perfection uh, and he died for sin for us rose again and now calls us to glory uh, for all who are in him. What a wonderful time to be together at Christmas time. Uh, welcome to the regulars and all the many visitors I can see among us. Uh, good to see everyone here. And it's so important, isn't it, to focus our thoughts at Christmas time on Christ because there are so many things that can take uh, Christ away from our thoughts. Um, this morning we have a shorter service. I go for about an hour, we'll be having some singing, uh, prayers, and uh, scripture reading, and a message as well. Uh, with the singing, now we are working on the AV, like a bit of a changeover happening, upgrade, and you'll only see the words from these two uh, screens here. So uh, there are some, um, Melissa, uh, there are, if you could grab those um, song sheets, that's it, and just give them to the people on either edge. So they can, um, so they can see. So you're not sort of straining your uh, necks around. So over here and over here, that'd be wonderful. Um, also, at Christmas time, for the Christmas service, we normally take up an offering uh, for the persecuted church, uh, that we as a church would support them, um, uphold them, and uh, encourage them. Now, we will not be taking up a physical offering uh, here today. But you can put forward, put through money to the church account. Uh, go to the website and the details are there. To the church account and just put the reference down, persecuted church. And that we would love to, as a church, give that money. We're going to be giving it to Barnabas Fund, uh, who advocate for the persecuted church. Um, also help the persecuted church as well. So uh, if you'd like to do that, you can do that online and direct that through to our church account. We'll make sure all of that money goes through to um, through to the Barnabas Fund. All right, I think that is all uh, with the announcements. Let me uh, open with a call to worship from a prophecy from Isaiah. Uh, and this is from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them... As light shone, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy in the harvest, as they are glad when they divided the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Uh, let us open in a word of prayer. Our eternal Father, eternal Son, and eternal Holy Spirit, Lord, you have deemed from the beginning of all time to come and redeem a people to yourself. Our Lord, and we see in the birth of Christ, the word becoming flesh and dwelling among us. And we behold the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth and joy. Lord, it is our great pleasure and delight uh, to come this morning and worship you, to remember what Christmas is about. It is the Redeemer who was born to live and to die and to rise again and bring a multitude to himself. And so, Lord, it is with grateful hearts and a rejoicing spirit that we come and sing praises to you 
as we read passages about you and as we uh, listen to the word preached. May you bless us and encourage our hearts for your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So Merry Christmas, everyone. What better song to begin with today than joy to the world, the Lord is come. Would you rise with me and sing together? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a King. Let every heart repair Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let many songs employ, while fields and plots, rocks, fields and plains. Repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. Our second song is O Holy Night. O Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees or oh, hear the angel voices oh no divine oh night when Christ was born, oh night, oh holy night, oh night divine, led by the light of faith serenely be. With glowing hearts, by his cradle we stand. So led by light of a star sweetly gleaming, here came the wise men from Orient land. The King of Kings lay the in lowly manger in all our trials born to be our friend he knows our need to our weakness is no stranger behold 
your king before him lowly bent behold your king before him lowly bent truly he taught us to love one another his law is love and his gospel is peace change shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name christ is the lord oh praise his name forever Um, there's so much to give thanks for, um, even as we are in the Christmas season, um, if we think about all that's happened this year, but more so if we think about uh, the meaning of Christmas, the reason for Christmas, um, Christ himself. And so join with me and join with us as we um, come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for Christ and his coming, Lord. Um, even now as we are singing um, the words that, uh, long lay the world in sin and error pining um, until you appeared and our soul, the soul, our soul felt its worth, um, Lord. And we had hope because you came. Uh, and because you came, Lord, we live uh, in the aftermath of your coming. Um, Lord, when we see across scripture the significance of your coming, we see that you came to take the penalty for our sin. Lord, you came to break the curse of sin, even as we were singing. Um, Lord, you came to draw us to yourself, um, and because you came, Lord, we can come to you. Before, because of your coming, Lord, we can gather here today and sing your praises. Thank you for coming. Thank you for leaving your throne above, um, for leaving the glory and the splendor and the majesty of heaven, uh, for leaving the praise of the angels and, and humbling yourself um, to servanthood, to be born in a manger, uh, and then to live the life of man to live it in perfection, and then to die on our behalf, Lord, that we might know you. Thank you. Thank you for your love, Lord, that you have shown towards us. And thank you, Lord, that you call us to live in the same way, uh, to live in humility, to, to show the love that you have for us to one another. And we thank you uh, particularly for um, the ability we have today uh, to give to our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who uh, may not have much, Lord. Um, Remember the words of Christ when he was speaking to his disciples and telling them of the day when you would judge the nations and um, when you'd say to those who are yours, um, come to me you, because you, you cared for me when I had no, no clothes. Um, you visited me in prison. You fed me when I was hungry. And the disciples asked, well, when did we do any of this? And you said that when you did this to the least of my brothers, you did it to me. So thank you, Father, that we can join we can serve you, Lord, by serving our brothers in Christ. And Father, we remember them today. Lord, we have the freedom here to gather and sing your praises, but our brothers and sisters in Christ who live in foreign lands um, do not have that same privilege. And so, Lord, we remember them and 
Um, Lord, just ask that you'd care for them uh, during this time, that even as they celebrate Christ, Lord, maybe not publicly, Lord, um, Lord, that you'd be with them, that they would be able to come before you and sing your praises, even as we're doing here. Um, be with us, Lord, through the rest of uh, the service and uh, through the rest of the day and through the rest of the season, Lord, um, even as we approach the end of the year. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us, Lord. And uh, be with us, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is taken from John chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 1 to 14. And I'm using the NASB, uh, but what you will see on the screen will be ESV. Uh, you can turn to your Bibles and you can follow along. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch a Silence. 
son of Mary. So bring him his gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him, the king of kings, salvation brings, let loving hearts enthrone him. Raise, raise the song on high, the virgin sings a lullaby. Joy, joy for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. Please be seated. Looking at uh, the passage that Sam read out just before from John 1.14. So you can have that open uh, when you are ready, I won't read it again. Uh, when we think of the coming of Christ, uh, we could think of it in one sense as like a multifaceted diamond or multi-faced diamond that you look from one angle and you'll get one picture. You look from another angle and you'll get another picture. And having looked and having uh, expended and exhausted your efforts, you will still not come to the end of exhausting the wonder that comes from looking at Christ. And it makes me wonder why we have eternity to be eternity. I think it's because we will spend eternity plumbing the depths of who Christ is, what He did, what He achieved, who we are now in Him. The Gospel writers, uh, when they present the coming of Christ narrative, they uh, and then, the, then looking at Christ through their Gospels, they, they look at Christ in many ways from different angles. Matthew will look at Christ as the coming king. We see that straight off the bat with the genealogy from the uh, tribe of Judah. Uh, and then obviously he'll see uh, Christ in many other facets throughout the, the Gospel. Mark will see Christ as the servant, uh, saviour, coming to give his life as a payment for sin. And the question is, who is this man? And who is this man if he's one to be sacrificed? Um, Luke will look at the Son of Man, uh, that he is both man and God, God incarnate. Now, Mark, he will start his gospel where Jesus starts his ministry. Matthew and Luke will start actually at the nativity scene. Uh, where we normally uh, like to read, and we read yesterday, the uh, account of Jesus born, being born. But John takes a totally different tact. Uh, his is a unique gospel. He will look at the eternal word becoming flesh. He will not begin at Jesus' ministry. He will not begin at the nativity scene, but he will go stretching right back before creation and look at the nature of who Christ is to bring us then to be in awe and wonder now this child, like uh, Mary or the Song of Mary. Who is this child? I mean, John is astounded to think of this one as being in eternity past, the Word becoming flesh. And he wants to show us, and it's going to be in John's Gospel that we're going to look, he wants to show us that when Jesus came, a new dawn came upon the earth. That which was given over to darkness has come to new life, to light. It was beautiful this morning as I was uh, just preparing my mind and my thoughts this morning. It was dark. And as I was doing that, the sun was coming up. And then the birds started to chirp. And I think this is probably the, the sort of picture that John wants to present. That darkness gives way to light and light gives way to life. The hymn writers, Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, in their hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, want to present it, present this idea of Jesus as the light of the world coming in. The eternal word coming into a new dawn. 
They say, hail the heaven-born prince of peace. Hail the son of righteousness, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. We're going to look at uh, the first 14 verses, but we're going to primarily uh, look at verses 9 to 13. And the first aspect I want you to see of Christ's coming is that the light has been revealed. The light is revealed. Now, John begins his, um, as I mentioned, his gospel in a sense where Genesis begins. You can see the correlation here, in the beginning. Now, Genesis begins the same, similar way, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but yet the earth was not formed. In fact, it was formless, it was void, it was dark. You could say it was a sort of cosmic chaos. It was dark, formless, void. And he brings, God brings in Genesis order out of disorder. He brings life where there is no life. Darkened chaos gives way to a blooming earth, like I saw this morning as the sun rose. And John begins here as almost like a retelling of the creation story, but not so much a physical creation as it is a spiritual recreation. The word here hovers over a darkened world, a world of chaos. Verse 9, it says, the true light, this is no counterfeit, the true light, which gives to light to everyone, was coming into the world. With this light came a new day, a new dawn, a new hope, a new salvation, a new joy. Let's have a closer look. John begins his gospel. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, you might think, what is this Word? What does it mean the Word was with God, the Word was God? Well, the Word is God's ultimate self-disclosure. It is God's ultimate self-disclosure. The Word was there to be revealed. God has revealed Himself in many ways. But here, the Word, God's ultimate self-disclosure was beginning at time, or before time, and will be disclosed in time. What was this Word? The Word was in the beginning. The Word was there eternally. In fact, the word was is in the imperfect tense and it's the continuation. So it could be read, in the beginning was the continuing word. And the word was continuing with God and the word was continually God. He is eternal, this word. But he's also the creator. He is the end of creation, this true light. Because it says in verse 3, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, anything that is not God came from God. Anything that is not the word Christ, the true light, came from Christ. You and I, everything. And now, in a spiritual kind of recreation, the eternal word, the true light shines, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The eternal, the ever shining light of the presence of God, the ultimate self-disclosure shines upon a darkened world. What does this mean? Well, this isn't some sort of cosmic chaos, this darkness. This is a darkness, a spiritual darkness, born by sin. He hovers over the spiritual darkness of sin, of unbelief, of lostness and death and pain and idolatry. Yes, it's a world of chaos, but it's a world of chaos because willful man has decided to depart from the true light, 
the true life from God himself. So unless this light brings life to this darkened world, this darkened world will will remain dark. People will remain in their sins. Unless God does something, light will not occur. Light will not ultimately come. In Genesis, God said, let there be light, and there was light. He just spoke with his word. But here, in John's gospel, he doesn't sort of emanate words from his lips and say, let there be light and something happens, as it is, he sends, quite phenomenal, the light into the world. He sends himself into this dark world, into this chaos, verse 9, he came, the true light came into the world in the incarnation of Christ. Verse 14, this eternal world, this word, this self-disclosure of God became flesh and dwelt among us. So as though the coming, the work, the teaching, the dying, the rising, which is Jesus, comes as a final and decisive message from God. In other words, what God has to finally say to all humil- humanity was not mainly what Jesus said, but who Jesus was, is, and did. It is Jesus is the light of the world. He is the final self-disclosure of God. He brings light to all people. And I love what it says here, that he dwelt among us. He, the word is tabernacled. It is to pitch his tent. It is not like the tent that is pitched outside the camp of Israel. We have to go to it. He comes and pitches his tent in this world, this darkened world with us. It made me think of Lot. Remember Lot? He pitched a tent. He pitched a tent near Sodom so that he could gain wealth and prosperity. He pitched his tent near sin for his gaining. Jesus pitches his tent himself in a darkened world. Not so much to gain, but to give. To give himself as a ransom for many. Jesus said this in John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He comes at great cost and pitches his tent in us, in the middle of us. The divine God becomes divine man. The one through whom all things were created becomes, as it were, created. The one through whom all things are sustained is yet being sustained. While feeding on his mother's milk, he is providing his mother's milk. Everything is sustained by this one. The angels discern this. And they, in their multitudes, declared the glory of it. The Magi understood it. They traveled, as it were, two years, it would seem, to get to the place to see the baby. And what did they do? They fell, as I said, on my knees, declaring this is the Christ, the Word, the eternal Word. Mary discerned it. She said, my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. In the coming of Jesus, the true light had come to give light, verse 9, to everyone. John is not wanting us to worship a sort of sentiment of Jesus, as if a cute little baby in a manger. This is the self-disclosure of God, of salvation, of light and life, to eradicate darkness to bring us to himself. 
the light of life. The baby in the manger isn't just a cute and cuddly thing in his mother's arms. It is the God upholding the universe. And he has come to bring life and shines so that everyone would come to the light, would come ultimately to him. But you know there's a great tragedy. And it picks it up in verse 10. This new day dawns over a darkened world through the revelation of Christ. But the great tragedy of sin and of wickedness in the human heart is that it says that he was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world did not know him. There seems to be tremendous resistance to the light. But still worse, it says in verse 11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. The God who gives very breath to all of us, yet he's denied. He came to the nation of uh, Israel. The prophecies pointed to him, yet they to receive him. They were godly people. They were moral people, people who read their Bibles and followed the commandments, but they rejected the light. They resisted him. You think of this. They're enjoying the light. They're enjoying, in a sense, the benefits of God, yet they reject him. The one whose love has been put forth in the created order that we could see. And we can see it like we've not seen it before. We look at the complexities and the magnitude of his creation. The universe stretching some 13 plus billion light years across and more. The microscopic intricacies of every molecule, every atom that we can look into. And instead of us causing us to wonder in awe of the God who created and sustained all this, we say there is no God. This has always been. There is no creator. The one who shines, whose love shines in our human conscience to reveal sin, we harden our conscience and push it down. And say, there is no right and wrong. He grants us intellect and to comprehend the one who mercifully sheathed his light in a human body so that he might bring life, spiritual light to all, was and is existed. How can that be? Why? Why didn't his people see him? Why don't we see him? Why don't we acknowledge him? Because the scriptures talk of us being in spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness to our sin. See, one great power of sin is that it blinds its people to the true nature of their character. Sinful, blind. But not only that, it's willful blindness Because people love their sin. John 3, 19 to 20. Jesus said, and this is the judgment. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light. Because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The light comes, darkened hearts say, no, I want to stay in my darkness. Let me give you a somewhat disturbing illustration, disturbing for me. I have got an aviary where I have birds, and we've got a cockatiel's nest, and it had some chicks in it, and it's dark in there. And so I open to see how the chicks are going. And I see at the bottom of the box all this, like, larvae 
all wiggling around. And then within seconds of the light shining in, it was like flat under the sawdust. Nothing there. And it makes me think of like the light of Christ coming in and yet we don't want it. We hide the grossness. We don't want it exposed. I had to get rid of those larvae. It was <laughs> not good. I cleaned it all up. The, the cockatiels did quite fine. But it just was gross. And that's, that's what sin is. It's gross. It doesn't want to be exposed. And so the light shines. The revelation of God in Christ shines. But we don't want it. Because sin is spiritually blind and people love their sin. But we know that the light will not be, will, the darkness will not overcome the light. You flip a, flick a switch, who's going to win? The darkness or the light? The light will every, win all the time. The light will just penetrate. And so will the light of Christ, because I love what it says here, the light will be received. Verse 12. But to all who re- did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Those who receive the light. And that means believe in his name as John states in verse 7, that they might believe through him. Believe that he is the saviour of the world, the disclosure of God's love in Christ. I love this word. Get the right to become children of God. I think this, um, this understanding of adoption into the family of God apparently overwhelmed John, for he said in 1 John 3, 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. When the revelation of Christ's light shines... And you do not retreat from the light. You stand and you say, I accept the light. I bring, Lord, you to me. I accept you. Expose my sin and I admit my sin. And I say, you died for my sin. If I do that, then extraordinary things hap- thing happens. Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about this. In John chapter 3, he says, the person who does that will be born again. Will be re- recreated, see? The light comes in bringing life, recreation, if I do not resist the light. Darkness has given way to light. Blindness has given way to sight. Rebellion has given way to submission. Hatred has given way to love. Sorrow to joy. Death to to life, having no name and no hope, now have an eternal God's name and eternal hope. This is no, not just any baby here. This is one bringing life from the dead to bring us into the family of God. How so? If all the world is in sin and darkness and blind and they love their sin. How does this happen? Verse 13. All who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Every decision of someone to come to Christ stands the decision of God to give this person new life. We are hope lost without the direct intervention of God to give us new life. And those words are so beautiful, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. That is sovereign triumph. He comes in. Behind every decision for Christ is a decision from God to regenerate the humble. Oh, how this should elevate God and humble us. God is the orchestrator. This new birth is a sheer miracle of coming into the family of God. And let me finish with this illustration, or or sorry, this story of a lady and family who adopt a child. And I think she paints it very, very well. The ones who are dead in their trespasses and sins have been brought now into the family of God, given life and a hope 
and a, and a, and a future. And she says this. I think within a nanosecond of deciding to adopt, we knew what our daughter's name would be. In fact, I don't really re ever recall discussing it very much. Perhaps it's because of why we chose to adopt. Our driving motivation was to rescue a little child and to give her a family at, with hope for the future. This helpless little girl who lives on the other side of the earth will receive all of the benefits of being my child. I will clothe her and I'll feed her. She will take on my name and receive my deepest affection. She will be the object of my love. My energies will be directed towards helping, instructing, and training her to be happy with a secure knowledge that I will never leave her. I will pour out my love to introduce her to the Savior of the world who can take away all her sin and give her eternal security. Of course, all of this is done as we completely depend on God for his strength. Where would we be without the love of God? Where would we be without him revealing himself to us in Scripture? Where would we be without him divinely sacrificing his own son and seeking us out to rescue us? So for us, and what this adoption is a reflection of, we only had one name to choose from, and that name is Grace. God's grace given to this little girl through this family because they received God's grace through Christ in the adoption of them into the family of God. John says, he be The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus speaks about the true light, that we may know Jesus, that we may love Jesus, worship him, and be with him forever. Let us follow him. Let us proclaim the light of his forgiveness of sin and the life that can be found in his salvation because there are dark pockets all around the world that need to hear the light. And if you have not come to the light, resist no more. Open yourself up for Christ. Receive him even today. Call upon his name. Confess your sins and be saved. May the Lord bless us today as we live in the knowledge of his light and the new life that we have in him and that we might be a light to all who receive. Let us just pray. Lord, our God, that is not just a baby in the manger. That is the word of the living God. The self-disclosure of your love, of your peace, of your mercy, of your atonement to bring us to God and to bring us in the family of God, to have a hope and life and a future. Our Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not come to the light, that they would receive the light today, that they would repent of their sins and ask Jesus to be their Lord and Saviour and not follow their own ways and their own course of life, but follow the ways of Christ. Lord, thank you. May you shine through us this very day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn for today is a beautiful response to the message that we've just heard. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, would you rise with me?
patient merits raise us to thy glorious throne. Beautiful hymn to uh, finish off on, and I will finish with this benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.